Links to the free Craftlit app for iOS, Android, and Windows smart devices appear in the sidebar of the show notes, along with details for joining the 2015 Craftlit UK tour. Our Craftlit app allows you easy access to premium member-only audio, as well as all of the free Craftlit shows for felicitous on-the-go listening. Current book Herland begins with episode 366. 367. Herland Chapter 2. Book Talk begins at 1840. Welcome to Craftlit, the podcast for crafters who love books. My name is Heather Ordover, and I'm podcasting from where the Delaware River meets the Old York Road, New Hope, Pennsylvania. Episode 367 Kiffles. This episode of Craftlit is brought to you by Survival Organs, handmade organs to throw, love, or cuddle at Etsy. And March Hair Yarns, hand-dyed yarns just for you. You can visit the March Hair at Etsy. And Subbable, the site where you can go to support your favorite content creators. Visit subbable.com slash craftlit and sign up for perks and fun. And Knit Circus, the e-newsletter bringing you three rings of knitting, sewing, and fun. You can find out more at knitcircus.com. Links to all of our sponsors can be found in the show notes at craftlit.com. Remember, their support for the show is what keeps it free for you. So go have a look. Well, hello. I very nearly called today's episode a rather blustery day because... It is, and I'm afraid you're probably going to be able to hear it in the background, but I can't control the weather. I know, it's shocking, but really, not so much. So instead, Kiffles. I discovered Kiffles this week. For those of you who've listened for a long time, you know that I had to go gluten-free, oh, I don't know, four years ago, five years ago? Not by choice, but by physiological mandate. And I found a gluten-free bakery. Oh, My goodness. It was the most amazing smell. It smelled like bread and pastries. And there in the case were mounds of kiffles. If you've never had a kiffle before, and there is a good probability that you have not, the information on the internet is contradictory. Some say it's Slovakian. Some say they're Hungarian. Some say they are Pennsylvania Dutch. (laughs) I get that you could confuse the Hungarian and the Slovakian because that's kind of regional, but the Pennsylvania Dutch, it turns out that there might be a large Slovak contingent around Lehigh Valley here in Pennsylvania. I am still researching this, and I am sure somebody who is listening knows more about this. But if you've ever had Hamantaschen or Rugula, these are very similar. Oh, and I just found a reference saying that that they're Yugoslavian now. Uh, They are pastry cookies, so it has a a very definite pastry feel to the dough. It's not a cookie. It's not crisp. It's kind of soft. And the filling is, in the case of our local bakery, apricot, raspberry, strawberry. The recipes I'm finding are very hamantaschen-like. Poppy seed, ground nuts, honey, that kind of thing. The kiffles look like they are cut into strips and then from that into squares And you put the jelly diagonally, or the the filling, whatever filling you want, diagonally across the square, and then you fold the corners in, kind of like you might roll a napkin uh, around silverware, if you were trying to be semi-fancy, but not, you know, make a swan out of the napkin. And that's it. That's it. It appears to be, more often than not, a cream cheese pastry dough. So I'm not sure how that falls out with Slovak and and Eastern European cooking. But I do know that when I've made Brinstov Holushki, which is the Slovak national dish, it's kind of a gnocchi with a sheep cheese and bacon sauce. I, I know, it's really good. It's the triple bypass special, but it's really good. When I've tried to find the Brinstov cheese here, sometimes it's impossible, depending on where I've lived. I have learned that I can pretty well substitute a brick of cream cheese and a brick of feta. And I can 
blend those together and get the right kind of creamy consistency. And the taste is close. It's not perfect, but it's close. So I'm thinking that this this might be American cream cheese or what we call cream cheese, that that, that kind of cheese is possible to get in places like Yugoslavia and Slovakia. And so loads of fun. In the show notes, you will find links to both a regular recipe for kniffles and a gluten-free recipe that looks to be safe. I haven't had a chance to test it yet because this is Thanksgiving week here in the United States, and that means everything is crazy. Well, this week I was able to talk to my sister-in-law about quilting. It was great to get a chance to talk to her, which I don't get to do nearly enough. I'm usually half crazed and out of my mind, but but I did get to talk to her about quilting, real big, big picture quilting, sewing strips and things like that. And and it was very enlightening. But because this week is Thanksgiving week, I haven't had a chance to edit the audio for you yet. However, in lieu of that, I have linked in the show notes to a variety of videos that I thought were more useful than others on methods of English paper piecing. And a couple of those come from Diane on Crafty Pod, who, as I said, we will be talking to while we're focusing on quilts for a little while. If you are a practitioner of a particular craft that you would like to have covered on Craftlid, please drop a line to scribe at craftlit.com. That'll get you to Vanessa. Vanessa will keep track of everyone and who and what. And then we'll start figuring out who we can talk to and what crafts we can focus on in the coming months while we work on Herland. Now, I know last week I mentioned, but I'm reinforcing it now, that we have a call-in line, 206-350-1642. If you are looking at the new iteration of the CraftLit app on a smart device, you will find the phone number as a hyperlink listed under Notes for an episode. And today I have two phone calls to share with you, one that came in right at the end of North and South and one that came in yesterday. The first one that we're going to listen to is from Laura, and it's about the poetry episode that we did. uh, Let's see. Episode 355 was the poetry episode. So here we go with Laura. Hi, Heather. This is Laura down in North Carolina, and I just listened to your poetic interlude. You were asking what we as parents or teachers or whatever can do to help children get poetry. That caused me to remember my father, who was always quoting snippets of this and snippets of that and singing verses of songs. I had a very strong memory of him quoting Richard Corey. He would say, and I remember it to this day, whenever Richard Corey came to town, the people stood and looked at him. He was a gentleman from soul to crown, clean shaven and immaculately slim. And that was so powerful for me. Of course, he quoted it more than once. And then, of course, when I finally read the poem and saw how it ended, it was wow. It was really wow. So, hey, if you want your kids to get poetry, quote it. (laughs) Just say poetry. Because how can you get it if you don't hear it? So that's my comment. And thank you for this episode. And yes, do more poetry. I love what Laura has to say. And I think she's absolutely dead on right. Because as soon as I started listening to what she was saying about her father, I remembered that when I was young, my grandfather walked around and recited Abu Ben Adam all the time. Little Orphan Annie, (laughs) not what you would think. It's a goblin poem. <laughs> it's kind of dark. Oh, and there were a couple others that he would he would recite. But then my, my parents did too. They they memorized stuff and they gave me a giant book of poetry, which I still have. It's an illustrated book of poetry. And for a while there I had to memorize a poem for a Friday night every week to recite at dinner. And they all recited as well, which I thought was very cool. We all had to come to the table with a poem, which was fun. You know, you get to see what they're attracted to, what I'm attracted to. And that was also the period of time when I would go after the poems that were shortest. So I did, um, He clasps the crag with crooked hands, 
close to the sun in lonely lands, ringed with the azure world he stands. The wrinkled sea beneath him crawls, he watches from his mountain walls, and like a thunderbolt, he falls. That was Alfred Lord Tennyson. It's called The Eagle. Not that you could tell that I was destined to major in theater or anything like that from, you know, the ripe old age of eight. Then there was also my favorite, which, and these are, I'm doing these by memory. Uh, Ella Telephony. I have no idea who did this. Once there was an elephant who tried to use the telephant. No, no, I mean an elephone who tried to use the telephone. Dear me, I'm not certain quite that even now I've got it right. How air it was he got his trunk entangled in the telefunk. The more he tried to get it free, the louder buzzed the telephy. I fear I'd better drop the song of elephop and telephong. But more important than those that I am dragging out of my childhood is Richard Corey. Richard Corey was written by Edwin Arlington Robinson. He lived from 1869 to 1935, and he would have never been known or remembered by anyone today if it weren't for Teddy Roosevelt. And if you haven't watched the Roosevelt biography that Ken Burns and his staff did that was recently on PBS, you must, you must go watch it. But Teddy Roosevelt wrote in praise of Edwin Arlington Robinson, and that cemented his future as a poet. And eventually, Teddy Roosevelt got him a job as a custom house worker, which you may recall is what Nathaniel Hawthorne did as well. I have a feeling that as a custom house man, you have a lot of free time to write, which is lovely and a saving grace for those of us who came after. Richard Corey, however, goes like this. Whenever Richard Corey went downtown, we people on the pavement looked at him. He was a gentleman from soul to crown, clean-favored and imperially slim. And he was always quietly arrayed, and he was always human when he talked. But still, he fluttered pulses when he said, good morning, and he glittered when he walked. And he was rich, yes, richer than a king, and admirably schooled in every grace. In fine, we thought that he was everything to make us wish that we were in his place. So on we worked, and waited for the light, and went without meat and cursed the bread. And Richard Corey, one calm summer night, went home and put a bullet through his head. Not what you were expecting. And, and certainly not what Laura was expecting from her father having quoted it. So I was really happy to hear Laura talk about Richard Corey, because I think it's an interesting, it's an interesting poem. And we got another voicemail this week from Tara. You may recall Tara, who is worcester weight at Ravelry, and she had a few things to share. Here is Tara. Hi, Heather. It's Tara. I don't know if anybody said this, but thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for putting in this listener line. It makes it very easy for us fangirls to call and gush about how awesome you are and how lucky you are to have grown up with a father with that voice. Can you imagine him reading something like Ferdinand the Bull or something a little more sophisticated like the Odyssey? How how lucky were you? Oh, my gosh. Thank you so much for sharing him with all of us. Secondly, I am over the moon that you are English paper piecing. I don't know how often you and Andrew drive around, but if ever you do and you want to bring it with you because it's small and compact and you can't quite get into your knitting yet, look for one of those sponge caddies with the suction cups for your on-the-go English paper piecing. I've seen a lot of them on Pinterest where a person has sewn a small drawstring bag to fit inside the caddy and has thread and needles and English paper pieces and fabric as well. I thought that might be an interesting hint for you if ever you go road tripping. Also, I had a question about the book. 
is the whole thing from the men's perspective. I think you mentioned it, but I don't remember. And if it is, this is going to be hilarious because your father puts the right emphasis into the voices and he does a really great job. And again, you are very, very lucky to have him to grow up reading your books to you. I I can't get over how lucky you are. Anywho, thanks for the podcast. I can't wait for the next episode. And tell your dad a great big thank you from all of We Craftlet listeners for reading her land for us. Hope you're having a great day. I'll talk to you later. Bye. Actually... It's interesting that Tara mentions the portability of the English paper piecing and different ways to carry it around. Nanette the Nanny sent me a sheepy bag, which I would have used for sock knitting, but right now is carrying a lot of pieces of paper piecing stuff. And the Quilting on the Go book that I had mentioned last week had a suggestion which I thought was genius. And that is to use one of those plastic coupon files. They're wallet-sized, they have dividers, and they're the little accordion things. And you can put a ridiculous number of templates and cut pieces of fabric and needles and pins and paper clips, which is a thing. If you watch any of the videos that I posted on English paper piecing, you'll notice that one of the tricky things that people keep using glue for, or glue sticks for, is to hold the fabric in place on the template while you baste it around the template. And that's all well and good unless you're using plastic templates that are reusable over and over and over again. And the Quilting on the Go book suggested that you use paper clips. And that's what I've been doing. And it's worked brilliantly. So I have, I have my little coupon book. And I'm actually going to put a picture of the sheepy bag from Nanette and my little coupon book on the show notes so that you can see actually what I'm talking about. The other thing is, yes, I, I actually was aware that I was really, really lucky to have a dad who reads books like that, partly because it's just easy to listen to, and partly because his voice is the voice in my head for The Hobbit, The Lord of the Rings, Pa Ingalls, and Ben Franklin's Autobiography. And those are not bad books to have that voice in your head for. (laughs) So that's pretty good. Oh, and The Phantom Tollbooth. And I make it sound like my mom never read to me, but that's absolutely not true. She read at least two-thirds of the Little House on the Prairie books or the Laura Ingalls Wilder books and tons of other books because I learned to read by reading with my mom. So yeah, no, they were both, they were both good readers. And in fact, my mom's voice, funny what you start remembering when you start remembering stuff. When we went camping, which was my entire childhood, mom would read in the car and she would usually read whatever it was that she was reading. So I think That is how I wound up finding Lord Peter Whimsey was because we were on a trip somewhere and my mom, my mom might have been reading the first one and read it out loud to us. Huh. That's funny. I remember the fact of her reading it in the car, but I can't remember which trip it was. But yeah, I was very, very lucky. And it's, you know, It's not a surprise that I wound up majoring in theater because we all read out loud to each other an awful lot when I was a kid. So, so Her Land, Chapter Two. As I've been researching, as we progress through the books, as I've been researching for Her Land and for The Picture of Dorian Gray, I have found a remarkable number of odd, unexpected, maybe not odd, unexpected similarities, and lines of crossover between the two stories, and not in ways that I would have expected. In fact, honestly, I wouldn't have expected any crossover, because I don't think you can get any more opposite to each other than Charlotte Perkins Gilman, fabulous feminist author of the early part of the 20th century, and Oscar Wilde, hedonist and... (laughs) And all around wit. And I mean, there is, what do they have in common? 
not much. But they cross over in an interesting area that you're going to start to see part of today. Gilman isn't going to waste any time getting us into her land. We are going to get into the society and see the women today. And I imagine, because we live when we live, that at least to a certain extent, there will be some parts of what we encounter today which you could have predicted. There will be other parts that might surprise you. Regardless, I'm going to wait until we get to the end after you've listened to it, to talk about this crossover between Oscar Wilde and actually Oscar Wilde and John Ruskin and Charlotte Perkins Gilman. It's interesting that these people from Oscar Wilde, who's publishing in 1887, 1890, 1891, that you have him influencing or paralleling Charlotte Perkins Gilman in some ways. And you have Ruskin, who was writing in the 1840s through the 1880s, and they all have this kind of matchup point. It's really kind of amazing. But in today's chapter, we follow the men. They have flown over and seen her land. They have scared the Bajujus out of some of the women, and they now are going to proceed on foot to go and actually make contact. In the last episode, we talked about how the men are kind of archetypes and that Gilman uses them as, in many ways, as tools to make her point. So you have Terry, who's kind of <laughs> kind of the jerk of the group, and you have Van, who is kind of the balanced middle. And then you have Jeff, who is, in many ways, the feminine side of men. And putting all three in the story gives Gilman an opportunity to allow different female types to play off of the different male types and for us to look at how we humans had over time developed gender rules, expectations. And historically, I think it's interesting that our human culture has, over the eons, seemed to have moved in and out of restrictive, very restrictive gender roles. And it depends on which society you're looking at, and it depends on which time you're looking at. And it also, I think, depends an awful lot on food production. And I say that because you go back and you look at, say, the Laura Ingalls Wilder books. And I know I always go back to these books, but they really do give us a snapshot, a very clear portrait of a family in the 1800s who were not living in an industrialized area, and giving us a chance to see, I don't want to use the word primitive because it's its not a primitive lifestyle. It's definitely in modern parlance, it would be a back to the land lifestyle where all of your food is coming from what you can get your hands onto around you. Subsistence in some ways, although they did very well for themselves at some points and not so well at other points. But you see in those books how much Ma is doing and expected to do so that when they get out onto the prairie, Pa is building the house, sure, but who's building it with him? He can't lift the logs by himself. It's Ma. And so the separation between men's work and women's work was, it absolutely was tied to need and necessity. And the more urban things got, the more striated gender roles became. Which is not to say that when you go back and you look at, say, Athens, during the golden age of Athens, there wasn't a distinct segregation between what the men could do and what the women could do, or, or more, more accurately, what the men could get away with and what the women were not allowed to do or even think or talk about. And certainly when morality becomes tied to gender roles and restrictions, you start to get all sorts of interesting things happening whether it's the church, uh, the Catholic church before the Reformation, whether it was the church dictating what men and women could and could not do, women not allowed to be priests. It started from square one that there were differences between what men and women were allowed to do. The morality question is important to Gilman in this case because there were moral arguments being made against women voting. There were moral arguments made against women working outside the home. And we've seen from all sorts of writers, Gilman in the Yellow Wallpaper, Virginia Woolf, many, many female authors 
we've seen what happens to women when they are not allowed a life of the mind. It doesn't do anyone any good. Because, as my husband likes to say, if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. Gilman, in creating her land, is purposefully removing this female society from any Western moral restrictions. She creates a whole other hierarchy and set of societal rules that we will be getting into shortly. But the stuff that her readership was bound by and restricted by and restrained by are not things you are going to see or experience in our country these days, unless you are really, really unlucky. Progress has been made, and we are very, very lucky, and I am very glad that it has been. All righty then. Let's listen to Chapter 2 of Her Land, written by Charlotte Perkins Gilman and read by Charles Hutchinson. Chapter 2. Rash Advances Not more than 10 or 15 miles we judged it from our landing rock to the last village. For all our eagerness we thought it wise to keep to the woods and go carefully. Even Terry's ardor was held in check by his firm conviction that there were men to be met, and we saw to it that each of us had a good stock of cartridges. They may be scarce, and they may be hidden away somewhere. Some kind of matriarchate, as Jeff tells us. For that matter, they may live up in the mountains yonder and keep the women in this part of the country. Sort of a national harem. But there are men somewhere. Didn't you see the babies? We had all seen babies, children, big and little, everywhere that we had come near enough to distinguish the people. And though by dress we could not be sure of all the grown persons, still there had not been one man that we were certain of. I always liked that uh, Arab saying, first tie your camel and then trust in the Lord, Jeff murmured. So we all had our weapons in hand and stole cautiously through the forest. Terry studied it as we progressed. Talk of civilization, he cried softly in restrained enthusiasm. I never saw a forest so petted, even in Germany. Look, there's not a dead bough. The vines are trained. Actually, and see here. And he stopped and looked about him, calling Jeff's attention to the kinds of trees. They left me for a landmark and made a limited excursion on either side. Food bearing, practically all of them, they announced, returning. The rest, splendid hardwood. Call this a forest? It's a truck farm. Good thing to have a botanist on hand, I agreed. Sure, there are no medicinal ones, or any for pure ornament? As a matter of fact, they were quite right. These towering trees were under as careful cultivation as so many cabbages. In other conditions, we would have found those woods full of fair foresters and fruit gatherers. But an airship is a conspicuous object, and by no means quiet. And women are cautious. All we found moving in these woods as we started through them were birds, some gorgeous, some musical, all so tame that it seemed almost to contradict our theory of cultivation, at least until we came upon occasional little glades where carved stone seats and tables stood in the shade beside clear fountains with shallow bird baths always added. They don't kill birds, and apparently they do kill cats, Carrie declared. Must be men here. Hark! We had heard something, something not in the least like a bird song, and very much like a suppressed whisper of laughter, a little happy sound, instantly smothered. We stood like so many pointers, and then used our glasses swiftly, carefully. It couldn't have been far off, said Terry excitedly. How about this big tree? There was a very large and beautiful tree in the glade we had just entered, with thick, wide-spreading branches that sloped out in lapping fans like a beech or pine. It was trimmed underneath some twenty feet up and stood there like a huge umbrella with circling seats beneath. Look, he pursued, there are short stumps of branches left to climb on. There's someone up in that tree, I believe. We stole near cautiously. 
Look out for a poison arrow in your eye, I suggested, but Terry pressed forward, sprang up on the seat back and grasped the trunk. In my heart, more likely, he answered. Gee, look, boys. We rushed close in and looked up. There among the boughs overhead was something, more than one something, that clung motionless, close to the great trunk at first, and then, as one and all, we started up the tree, separated into the three swift-moving figures and fled upward. As we climbed, we could catch glimpses of them scattering above us. By the time we had reached about as far as three men together dared push, they had left the main trunk and moved outward, each one balanced on a long branch that dipped and swayed beneath their weight. We paused, uncertain. If we pursued further, the boughs would break under the double burden. We might shake them off, perhaps, but none of us was so inclined. In the soft, dappled light of these high regions, breathless with our rapid climb, we rested a while, eagerly studying our objects of pursuit, while they, in turn, with no more terror than a set of frolicsome children in a game of tag, sat as lightly as so many big, bright birds on their precarious perches and, frankly, curiously, stared at us. Girls, whispered Jeff under his breath, as if they might fly if he spoke aloud. Peaches, added Terry, scarcely louder. Peacherinos, apricot nectarines. Woo! They were girls, of course. No boys could ever have shown that sparkling beauty, and yet none of us were certain at first. We saw a short hair, hatless, loose, and shining. A suit of some light, firm stuff, the closest of tunics of knee breeches, met by trim gaiters. As bright and smooth as parrots and as unaware of danger, they swung there before us, wholly at ease, staring as we stared, till first one, and then all of them, burst into peals of delighted laughter. Then there was a torrent of soft talk tossed back and forth, no savage sing-song, but clear, musical, fluent speech. We met their laughter cordially, and doffed our hats to them, at which they laughed again delightedly. Then Terry wholly in his element, made a polite speech with explanatory gestures and proceeded to introduce us with pointing finger. Mr. Jeff Margrave, he said clearly. Jeff bowed as gracefully as a man could in the fork of a great limb. Mr. Van Dyke Jennings. I also tried to make an effective salute and nearly lost my balance. Then Terry laid his hand upon his chest, a fine chest he had, too, and introduced himself. He was braced carefully for the occasion, and achieved an excellent obeisance. Again they laughed delightedly, and the one nearest me followed his tactics. Celis, she said distinctly, pointing to the one in blue. Alima, the one in rose. Then, with a vivid imitation of Terry's impressing manner, she laid a firm, delicate hand on her gold-green jerkin. Elador. This was pleasant, but we got no nearer. We can't sit here and learn the language, Terry protested. He beckoned to them to some. We can't sit here and learn the language, Terry protested. He beckoned to them to come nearer, most winningly. But they gaily shook their heads. He suggested by signs that we all go down. He suggested by signs that we all go down together. But again they shook their heads, still merrily. Then Elidor clearly indicated that we should go down, pointing to each and all of us with unmistakable firmness, and further seeming to imply by the sweep of a lithe arm that we not only go downward, but go away altogether, at which we shook our heads in turn. I have to use bait, grinned Terry. I don't know about you fellows, but I came prepared. He produced from an inner pocket a little box of purple velvet that opened with a snap and out of it he drew a long, sparkling thing, a necklace of big, varicolored stones that would have been worth a million if real ones. He held it up, swung it, glittering in the sun, offered it first to one, then to another, holding it out as far as he could reach toward the girl nearest him. He stood braced in the fork, held firmly by one hand. The other, swinging his bright temptation, reached far out along the bow, but not quite to his full stretch. She was visibly moved, I noted, hesitated, spoke to her companions. 
They chattered softly together, one evidently warning her, the other encouraging. Then softly and slowly she drew nearer. This was Alima, a tall, long-limbed last, well-knit and evidently both strong and agile. Her eyes were splendid, wide, fearless, as free from suspicion as a child's who has never been rebuked. Her interest was more that of an intent boy playing a fascinating game than of a girl lured by an ornament. The others moved a bit farther out, holding firmly, watching. Terry's smile was irreproachable, but I did not like the look in his eyes. It was like a creature about to spring. I could already see it happen. The drop necklace, the sudden clutching hand, the girl's sharp cry as he seized her and drew her in. But it didn't happen. She made a timid reach with her right hand for the gay, swinging thing. He held it a little nearer. Then, swift as light, she seized it from him with her left and dropped on the instant to the bow below. He made a snatch quite vainly, almost losing his position as his hand clutched only air. And then, with inconceivable rapidity, the three bright creatures were gone. They dropped from the ends of the big boughs to those below, fairly pouring themselves off the tree, while we climbed downward as swiftly as we could. We heard their vanishing gay laughter. We saw them fleeting away in the wide open reaches of the forest and gave chase, but we might as well have chased wild antelopes. So we stopped at length somewhat breathless. No use, gasped Harry. They got away with it. My word, the men of this country must be good sprinters. Inhabitants evidently arboreal, I grimly suggested. Civilized and still arboreal, peculiar people. You shouldn't have tried it that way, Jeff protested. They were perfectly friendly. Now we've scared them. But it was no use grumbling, and Terry refused to admit any mistake. Nonsense, he said. They expected it. Women like to be run after. Come on, let's get to that town. Maybe we'll find them there. Let's see. It was in this direction and not far from the woods, as I remember. When we reached the edge of the open country, we reconnoitered with our field glasses. There it was, about four miles off. The same town, we concluded. Unless, as Jeff ventured, they all had pink houses. The broad green fields and closely cultivated gardens sloped away at our feet. A long, easy slant with good roads winding pleasantly here and there, and narrower paths besides. Look at that, cried Jeff suddenly. There they go. Sure enough, close to the town, across a wide meadow, three bright-hued figures were running swiftly. How could they have got that far in this time? It can't be the same ones, I urged. But through the glasses, we could identify our pretty tree climbers quite plainly, at least by costume. Terry watched them, we all did for that matter, till they disappeared among the houses. Then he put down his glass and turned to us, drawing a long breath. Mother of Mike, boys, what gorgeous girls, to climb like that, to run like that, and afraid of nothing. This country suits me all right. Let's get ahead. Nothing venture, nothing have, I suggested, but Terry preferred. Faint heart, ne'er one fair lady. We set forth in the open, walking briskly. If there are any men, we'd better keep an eye out, I suggested, but Jeff seemed lost in heavenly dreams, and Terry in highly practical plans. What a perfect road. What a heavenly country. See those flowers, will you? This was Jeff, always an enthusiast, but we could agree with him fully. The road was some sort of hard manufactured stuff, sloped slightly to shed rain, with every curve and grade had a gutter as perfect as if it were Europe's best. No man, eh? sneered Terry. On either side, a double row of trees shaded the footpaths. Between the trees, bushes or vines, all fruit-bearing, now and then seats and little wayside fountains. Everywhere, flowers. We'd better import some of these ladies and set them to park in the United States, I suggested. Mighty nice place they've got here. We rested a few moments by one of the fountains, tested the fruit that looked ripe, and went on, impressed, for all our gay bravado by the sense of quiet potency which lay about us. Here was evidently a people highly skilled, efficient, caring for their country as a florist cares for his costliest orchids. Under the soft, brilliant blue of that clear sky, in the pleasant shade of those endless rows of trees, 
We walked unharmed, the placid silence broken only by the birds. Presently there lay before us, at the foot of a long hill, the town or village we were aiming for. We stopped and studied it. Jeff drew a long breath. I wouldn't have believed a collection of houses could look so lovely, he said. They've got architects and landscape gardeners in plenty, that's for sure, agreed Terry. I was astonished myself. You see, I come from California, and there's no country lovelier, but when it comes to towns, I have often groaned at home to see the offensive mess man made in the face of nature, even though I'm no art sharp like Jeff. But this place, it was built mostly of a sort of dull rose-colored stone, and here and there some clear white houses, and it lay abroad among green groves and gardens like a broken rosary of pink coral. Those big white ones are public buildings, evidently, Terry declared. This is no savage country, my friend. But no, men, boys, it behooves us to go forward most politely. The place had an odd look, more impressive as we approached. It's like an exposition. It's too pretty to be true. Plenty of palaces, but where are the homes? Oh, there are little ones enough, but it certainly was different from any towns we had ever seen. There's no dirt, said Jeff suddenly. There's no smoke, he added after a little. There's no noise, I offered, but Terry snubbed me. That's because they are laying low for us. We'd better be careful how we go in there. Nothing could induce him to stay out, however, so we walked on. Everything was beauty, order, perfect cleanness, and the pleasantest sense of home over it all. As we neared the center of the town, the homes stood thicker, ran together, as it were, grew into rambling palaces grouped among parks and open squares, something as college buildings stand in their quiet greens. And then, turning a corner, we came into a broad paved space and saw before us a band of women standing close together, in even order, evidently waiting for us. We stopped a moment and looked back. The street behind us was closed by another band, marching steadily, shoulder to shoulder. We went on. There seemed no other way to go and presently found ourselves quite surrounded by this close massed multitude. Women, all of them. But they were not young. They were not old. They were not, in the girl sense, beautiful. They were not in the least ferocious. And yet, as I looked from face to face, calm, grave, wise, wholly unafraid, evidently assured and determined, I had the funniest feeling, a very early feeling, a feeling that I traced back in memory until I caught up with it at last. It was the sense of being hopelessly in the wrong, and that I had so often felt in early youth when my short legs' utmost effort failed to overcome the fact that I was late to school. Jeff felt it too. I could see he did. We felt like small boys, very small boys, caught doing mischief in some gracious lady's house. But Terry showed no such consciousness. I saw his quick eyes darting here and there, estimating numbers, measuring distances, judging chances of escape. He examined the close ranks about us, reaching back far on every side, and murmured softly to me, Every one of them's over forty is. I'm a sinner. Yet they were not old women. Each was in the full bloom of rosy health, erect, serene, standing sure-footed and light as any pugilist, they had no weapons, and we had, but we had no wish to shoot. I'd as soon shoot my aunts, muttered Terry again. What do they want with us anyhow? They seem to mean business. But in spite of that business-like aspect, he determined to try his favorite tactics. Terry had come armed with a theory. He stepped forward with his brilliant, ingratiating smile and made low obeisance to the women before him. Then he produced another tribute— a broad, soft, a broad, soft scarf of filming texture, rich in color and pattern, a lovely thing even to my eye, and offered it with a deep bow to the tall, unsmiling woman who seemed to head the ranks before him. She took it with a gracious nod of acknowledgment and passed it on to those behind her. He tried again, this time bringing out a circlet of rhinestones, a glittering crown that could have pleased any woman on earth. 
He made a brief address, including Jeff and me as partners in his enterprise, and with another bow presented this. Again, his gift was accepted and, as before, passed out of sight. If they were only younger, he muttered between his teeth. What on earth is a fellow to say to a regiment of old colonels like this? In all our discussions and speculations, we had always unconsciously assumed that the women, whatever else they might be, would be young. Most men do think that way, I fancy. Woman, in the abstract, is young, and we assume charming. As they get older, they pass off the stage somehow, into private ownership mostly, or out of it altogether. But these good ladies were very much on the stage, and yet any one of them might have been a grandmother. We looked for nervousness. There was none. For terror, perhaps. There was none. For uneasiness, for curiosity, for excitement. And all we saw was what might have been a vigilance committee of women doctors, as cool as cucumbers and evidently meeting to take us to task for being there. Six of them stepped forward now, one on either side of each of us, and indicated that we were to go with them. We thought it best to accede, at first anyway, and marched along, one of these close at each elbow and the others in close masses before, behind, on both sides. A large building opened up before us, a very heavy, thick-walled, impressive place, big and old-looking, of gray stone, not like the rest of the town. This won't do, said Terry to us quickly. We mustn't let them get us in this, boys, altogether, now. We stopped in our tracks. We began to explain, to make signs pointing away toward the big forest, indicating that we would like to go back to it at once. It makes me laugh, knowing all I do now, to think of us three boys. Nothing else. Three audacious, impertinent boys, butting into an unknown country without any sort of guard or defense. We seemed to think that if there were men, we could fight them. And if there were only women, why, there would be no obstacle at all. Jeff, with his gentle, Jeff, with his gentle, romantic, old-fashioned notions of women as clinging vines. Terry, with his clear, decided, practical theories that there were two kinds of women those he wanted and those he didn't. Desirable and undesirable was his demarcation. The latter as a large class, but negligible. He had never thought about them at all. And now here they were in great numbers, evidently indifferent to what he might think, evidently determined on some purpose of their own regarding him, and apparently well able to enforce their purpose. We all thought hard just then. It had not seemed wise to object to going with them, even if we could have. Our one chance was friendliness, a civilized attitude on both sides. But once inside that building, there was no knowing what these determined ladies might do to us. Even peaceful detention was not to our minds, and when we named it imprisonment, it looked even worse. So we made a stand, trying to make clear that we preferred the open country. One of them came forward with a sketch of our flyer, asking by signs if we were the aerial visitors they had seen. This we admitted. They pointed to it again and then to the outlying country in different directions, but we pretended we did not know where it was, and in truth we were not quite sure and gave a rather wild indication of its whereabouts. Again they motioned to us to advance, standing so packed about the door that there remained but the one straight path open. All around us and behind they were massed solidly. There was simply nothing to do but go forward or fight. We held a consultation. I never fought with women in my life, said Terry, greatly perturbed. But I'm not going in there. I'm not going to be herded in as if we were in a cattle chute. We can't fight them, of course, Jeff urged. They're all women. In spite of their nondescript clothes, nice women, too. Good, strong, sensible faces. I guess we'll have to go in. We may never get out if we do, I told them. Strong and sensible, yes, but I'm not sure about the good. Look at those faces. They had stood at ease, waiting while we conferred together, but never relaxing their close attention. Their attitude was not the rigid discipline of soldiers. There was no sense of compulsion about them. Terry's term of vigilance committee was highly descriptive. They had just the aspect of sturdy burghers, gathered hastily to meet some common need or peril, 
all moved by precisely the same feelings to the same end. Never anywhere before had I seen women of precisely this quality. Fishwives and market women might show similar strength, but it was coarse and heavy. These were merely athletic, light, and powerful. College professors, teachers, writers. Many women showed similar intelligence, but often wore a strained, nervous look, while these were as calm as cows for all their evident intellect. We observed pretty closely just then, for all of us felt that it was a crucial moment. The leader gave some word of command and beckoned us on, and the surrounding mass moved a step nearer. We've got to decide quickly, said Terry. I vote to go in, Jeff urged. But we were two to one against him, and he loyally stood by us. We made one more effort to be let go, urgent, but not imploring, in vain. Now for a rush, boys, Terry said, and if we can't break him, I'll shoot in the air. Then we found ourselves much in the position of the suffragettes trying to get to the Parliament buildings through a triple cordon of London police. The solidity of those women was something amazing. Terry soon found that it was useless, tore himself for a moment, pulled his revolver and fired upward. As they caught at it, he fired again. We heard a cry. Instantly, each of us was seized by five women, each holding arm or leg or head. We were lifted like children, straddling helpless children, and borne onward, wriggling indeed, but most ineffectually. We were born inside, struggling manfully, but held secure most womanfully, in spite of our best endeavors. So carried and so held, we came into a high inner hall, gray and bare, and were brought before a majestic gray-haired woman who seemed to hold a judicial position. There was some talk, not much among them, and then suddenly there fell upon each of us at once a firm hand holding a wetted cloth before mouth and nose, an odor of swimming sweetness, anesthesia. So, anesthesia. <laughs> Were you expecting that? I was not expecting that the first time I read the book. That one surprised me. But I loved the description of the women in the tree, especially, especially the one who faked Terry out. It's fun. <laughs> to watch to watch the women get one up on Terry. I'd gone and checked out Ravelry to see how people were liking the book because, of course, this is a very different book for Craftlet. Many of you have never heard of the book or you had to read it in college and didn't like it very much or you'd read it, but it was a gazillion years ago, like for me, and hadn't even thought about it since then. But I was happy to see the reactions on Ravelry were both what an intriguing and odd book. And wow, I could listen to your dad all day long. And I, I know he has that kind of soothing voice. I'm glad that you are enjoying it as well. Well, next week, of course, we will pick up with our poor men, poor men, <laughs> somewhere coming out of their anesthesia, I imagine. Don't forget, we have a final raffle for the month of November, the Felt So Good book. If you are interested in winning a copy of the book, which is a paperback book, it's lovely. You can take a look at the review that I did over on the Mama O Knits website and put yourself in the running to win a copy. It doesn't take much to enter the raffle. All you do is click on the little widget that you'll see there that has the picture of the Felt So Good book and then pick one of the ways to enter. You can tweet or you can share on Facebook or share on a blog. There are lots of different ways to enter. And the link to that can be found in the show notes. Oh, and one last thing. If you are interested in audio production, or if you know someone in college who is interested in audio production, or if you're an actor who would be interested in audio production, please have them get in touch with me. We are rapidly running out of audio that is good enough for you. And well, I would be more than happy to just continue to have my father and John Scholes read books for us. I think I will exhaust them <laughs> if, I, if I take that tack. And we're now at a point where I won't be able to wrangle audio as much as I would like to. So I need to find somebody who can organize and orchestrate and know how to advise actors 
so that they can get their microphones right and get the levels right and then compile everything together and clean it up and get it to us. Because there are lots of people, particularly over on Ravelry, lots of people with lots of great ideas for books to do in the future, but there isn't any good free audio for those books. And the corollary to looking for actors and audio producers is looking for translators. People are always asking, why haven't we done any Russians? Why haven't we done anything French? Why haven't we done Don Quixote? And the answer is quite simply, because I would have to use Victorian translations, and they are not the best translations. And in order to get a good translation, it would either have to be in the public domain or something that we commission. So if you know anybody who's into translating, I would love to do Candide or Don Quixote or anything by Chekhov or, you know, I mean, there's tons of stuff that we can't, we just can't touch right now. So yes, if you know anyone, please send them my way, heather at craftlit.com. And we can talk further about what is needed and what we can do. Until then, I hope you have a great week. If you're in the United States, happy Thanksgiving. I hope the L-tryptophan doesn't put you to sleep too early. (laughs) Take care of yourselves. Be nice to each other. Have a great one. Bye. Like Craftlet? Leave a review for us on iTunes, like us on Facebook, or subscribe at Subbable. If one audiobook with benefits a week isn't enough for you, you can also sign up for a premium membership. There is a streaming option that sends the premium audio through your smartphone or tablet, or there's a downloading option where you can download the files into your computer's hot little hands. Craftlet is made possible by the generous support of its listeners. And for that, I am truly grateful. And remember, if your hands are too busy to pick up a book, at least you can turn one on.